the amount of power it took to actually drive drive this event, I think, is pretty amazing. And I knew I had to feed a cable in here somewhere. So, 100,000 feet, that's a lot. So we actually, for our, um, for our, uh, our internet access, we had two 10 gig wave circuits brought in by CenturyLink, 1,300 voice lines, 1,300 gig ports, um, basically had 11N wireless in all these places, including on the outdoor stands were wireless as well. So we kind of thought about that. 125 of the monitors, which we talked about. And we had actually uh, wired for up to 135, so we had a little room to grow there. That got a little closer for my comfort than I, <laughs> than I wanted. Uh, we actually built an HD channel lineup, so basically we built the close circuit television, so all of the key ones were there. You know, CNN, C-SPAN, your major networks, things like that. And of course we had um, AWS that hosted the website. So the fun's not over yet. Um, it took us eight months to build. We had to have this torn down. And now, when I say in 48 hours, everything wasn't gone in 48 hours, but we had to have the arena and the basketball court available because we had events. We had some kid uh, camps coming in the Hamilton, which was the media filing center, and we had a, a, a hockey match 48 hours later. So literally, that, that's just, I thought it was pretty cool. That's a pile of power strips. Those are all, <laughs> all the media center and stuff. And, the cable and the switches and stuff like that. What, so it was, what was the, the biggest last minute problem or surprise that you had to overcome? Because there had to be something. Um, the biggest issue was, and this was on day one, it wasn't on day zero, it was on day one, is somehow a Greco had a power issue because one of the media trucks lost power on day one. Hmm. That was the closest to day zero. But honestly, um, the impact, it didn't really impact on any of our network equipment. I don't, I don't remember which, I think it was CBS, was out for like 30 minutes until, until the Greco figured it out. And that, they were on the outdoor backup power, right? So. so this is kind of kind of a summary when it's all said and done, is you have to understand for a project like this is don't expect the scope to be reasonable. Don't, ex don't expect it to stop. It's going to keep changing all the way through. Um, Secret Service were hugely, hugely disruptive. They have a tough job. Don't get me wrong. I wouldn't want that job. Very, very difficult. But it did change the scope of things. This is a picture of where the people with the bus dropped them off. This is the checkpoint. And you can see the steeple of Magnus oh, Arena. Hi. That's the checkpoint. I mean, it looks like something between Israel and, and Palestine, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, that's literally kind of what it was like. Um, use, your, use as much project management expertise as you can. Um, you know, sometimes when you're doing a project, you say, hey, we can do project light. You know, we can do some good documentation. We don't have to put too much overhead. This was not one of those projects. This is where you literally need to have the right control points and gates in place to make sure that everything was going. One thing we did learn was that at one point we had a project plan and centrally, in retrospect, we should have been integrated those on day one. We did it later, but we probably should have, that would have made, made things kind of a lot smoother because we actually had people show up a week when we weren't expecting them. And it's like, what's going on here? And there was some gap between the project plans. It's roughly, how many project plans were integrated? Um, CenturyLink, Cisco, us, facilities, event services, CPD. So how do you manage all the dependencies? Um, what we finally did was um, we had through our facilities department, we integrated that into one program plan, which everyone sent our project plan. They integrated them all together. We had one program manager that everyone's That's project right. manager reported up to the program manager, mm. which is the way we should have done it from the start. Mm. It kind of makes sense, right? You got to because you can say I need it by this date, and there were so many interdependencies between even the facilities, event services, and dates, and IT was huge, right? And then of course from the CPD, and they were the worst at changing scope, to be honest with you. We actually work pretty well with the facilities department, really, really well. We do this all the time, not to this scope, but so that wasn't an issue. We were already sharing information, we were having meetings, and then we realized that that was a little off kilter. But then we also had to bring our business partner plans in as well. 
So um, from an opportunity standpoint, we talked about, we were able to do a lot of investment in infrastructure, which has really helped our students and faculty out. Um, great opportunity. Um, we actually changed the university logo because we used to have a little square DU kind of thing and we changed it to more of the shield. We had signage up for the debate fest, uh, everywhere you could point a camera as we talked about and we also did some permanent structures. So the debate provided the perfect opportunity to launch our new brand and logo. And you know, we're trying to take DU into the 21st century and kind of be much more of that te technologically advanced and forward thinking regional um, institution and we really we really took advantage of that and we were also thinking ahead because next year is our 150th anniversary so we're taking all these things and kind of keeping the ball rolling and rolling it in into it and I guess really kind of the last lesson is um, don't forget about the people because you know one of the things that I tried I, I tried to do was you know don't micromanage but be present and attentive listen watch trust your team because they're the experts in different areas trust your business partners make sure they work together just but just be there I would just like in the last month every day I'm walking around the site just walking I start I, I said I, I, I asked my admin I said just clear my calendar the month up to the chancellor wants to meet with me great I'll do that otherwise I'll, I'm gonna go to the steering committee meetings for this and all that but I need to be kind of visible. And you know, there are, there are a few people that were showing stress and you have to kind of watch that. And if you're not paying attention, it can slip. So it, it happens. So how does this change your approach to, to the smaller, more day-to-day -day projects that you have to manage? That's a great question. I think one thing we learned from this is, um, and this is a hugely complex project. One thing we learned though was that having regular regular touch points, similar to like you're going to do a scrum. You don't have to have a bunch of formal meetings, but if you just get people together on a regular basis, okay, what are our what are our daily goals or weekly goals or whatever as it applies to this project are so helpful because it's not burdensome, it doesn't take a lot of time, but it also it keeps you as a project manager or program manager or project sponsor aware of kind of what's going on. Another thing we've learned is if we're using external stakeholders, which we do a lot, you know, Cisco, Elucian, Blackboard, whoever, is get them involved in the project planning process, and that's something we're definitely doing. And we're now, um, at the time, we did not have an integrated web tool to actually manage our projects. We're doing that through ServiceNow, so we kind of use this as an opportunity to kind of really improve. So. And then, personally, what skills do you have that, that you felt really helped you succeed at this? Um, so, first of all, anyone ever heard of a DISC assessment? Yeah. A DISC, it's kind of like, you know, dominance, in, influencer, supportive, stable, conscientious. I'm a strong I. I just, which means I'm the cheerleader, I'm the collaborator, I'm the influencer. I think that role worked really, really well here. Okay, I'm not going to be the technical giant in the room. I'm not the type that really wants to dig in on every little thing. I'm good at technology. There's better. I'm never the smartest guy or gal in the room. Okay, when it's all said and done. So my thought is we had a good compliment. We had some really, really strong technical people that were the ones that really want to dig into every, every detail. There were some times we needed that. We have folks that were more time driven. The dominant type tend to be more get it done, get it done, get it done those roles came out. Then there were the supportive group. I felt like that really want to get input from other people and are concerned about the welfare of others. That was really important. It's not that any of these are good or bad. You really need them all. Mm -hmm. But I think we had, a, we had a good compliment. So I think my takeaway from that is as you're building a project team, it helps to know their work styles. It's not to label anyone as being one because everyone can work in all in all those quadrants, mm -hmm. but what is people? What are folks' natural tendencies? And you build projects, teams based on complementary skills. I think we learned a lot from that. Mm -hmm. Now we're still starting to kind of practice that, and some folks are oh, on the team are a little worried, like you know, you're labeling me. I'm, I'm like, no, I'm going to leverage what you're really good at. And you have to kind of make it a very, a very positive thing. So that was a great takeaway. So I really think this was more about organizational development and people than it was from, because all the technologies here. 
these are commodity technologies. Nothing really here other than a couple of minor things were really that kind of bleeding edge kind of stuff. It was really more about the, imp the implementation yeah. and the support and the planning. Besides the, besides the website, um, did you have any other software projects going on? Uh, yeah, um, that's a great question. We actually, from a network services standpoint, we built an overlay DNS, DHCP, so all the traditional networking services to support um, the IP capturing, filtering, firewall, all those kind of things we built from scratch. So not the traditional user app, but those are more network services. We used, a, and this was kind of a, a lesson learned, we used a pretty new tool, Cisco's ICE, which is their, yeah. I, I don't remember what they actually New security stack or whatever. Yeah, it that's it. It's kind of their authentication services. In retrospect, you don't want to use a new tool for something this big because there's a pretty good learning curve. Cisco helped us make it happen. They did a good job, but this was day two before we had all the bugs ironed out on this one. That was a little nerve wracking, to be honest with you. So that, I consider that to be a software service. Other than that, most of the desktop stuff, we just had to make sure it had kind of the traditional office product. So there was really no major software other than really the website that we had to specifically roll out for this. Did you say you used a web project management tool? Yeah, ServiceNow. ServiceNow. Yeah. ServiceNow is ITM based, so it's kind of based on the ITIL kind of library structure. We're using it right now for incident management, problem management, change management, service request management. And that did your project management. And project management. And it has the capability to do asset management as well. We just haven't gotten that far down the road. It's, it's, it's a great SaaS tool. It's pretty cheap for an institution our size. I think we're paying about 75 grand a year for software as a service for the number of seats we need. So that's that's not bad. I mean, when you go to like a full BMC Remedy or something like that, if you've seen those things, I mean, you're talking at least a quarter million dollars. So this is a bargain for us. And it works great. And, very iPad and browser friendly and stuff. So I literally have people in the field on their iPhones actually up, they can update their tickets on the fly, which is kind of cool. Well, I thank everyone. Thank you so much.